figured out finally, man. Hey, man. Yeah, man. Hey, I appreciate you getting up on here, man. Man, all love, baby. I told you, bro. You my dude. Whatever you need me, bro, hit me up. <laughs> man, I appreciate it. I know we got people. We still got people uh, trying to get in there. I see your wife. How you doing, Asia? <laughs> hey, uh -oh. Can't no man say nothing crazy. Hey, nothing. Hey, nothing crazy, bro. Nothing crazy at all. Nothing crazy at all, man. But look, I just want to say thank you for your time, man, and jumping on my podcast called Life After Sports. And I appreciate you. This is my second week, and it's great to have Channing Crowder on my show, you know, so that we could be able to talk some football language, talk life about life after sports, talk about what you've done in your career and, and post-career and, and how you've just, you know, been very successful in what you're doing off the field. And uh, so I appreciate, again, you taking the time to, to jump on here with me, man. I mean, you do this for a living anyway now, you know, talking. Look, you've done it when you was in the league anyway. <laughs> yeah, man. The country folks, man. Country dude. That's why I tell you, man, you got to get all the women out there. Get your country, man. We we communicate. We know how to talk. Sitting on the porch, talking, making people laugh, all the good stuff, man. You know, people need to sit on their phones and play all day. And y'all making fun of me about not knowing how to IG live. That ain't what life's about. Life's about human interaction live. IG live ain't where it's at. But, man, no, I appreciate you, bro. All love. You, you grind, too. So that's what I say, bro. You know how it is. Man, I, do baby, I got you. man, I appreciate, man, I appreciate it, man. I really do appreciate it. Like I said, this is my second week of this podcast, and I want to congratulate what you're doing as well on I'm an athlete. I am an athlete podcast, man. I've been watching you guys' episode, man. It's hilarious. Hey, if you guys are not tuned in, you need to go and tune in to their podcast. It's called I Am an Athlete Podcast. All right, we got Channing on there. We got Reggie Wayne. We got um, Fred B. Taylor, Marshall. and we got B Marshall on there. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, man, it's hilarious, man. So y'all doing it every, what is it, every week? Yeah, every week, uh, Tuesday nights, 9 o'clock on YouTube. You go to YouTube, I Am Athlete Podcast. Just search it on YouTube. You'll pop up. We got uh, two episodes now. We're shooting. We got a third one coming out. We're shooting, I think, another one this Saturday. Tomorrow we'll shoot another one. So, yeah, man, we just, you know, people at home got a little, need a little content. So, actually, B. Marshall got it together. B. Marshall reached out to us. We all neighbors. Me, Fred, B. Marshall, we're all neighbors. Uh, Reggie. So we just over there messing around at the house one day, and B. Marshall was like, "Hey, y'all, let's 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 put a little show together. I got a little production crew. You know, I got the I got all the technical sides handled. If y'all bring the content, so with all the personalities, Reggie's a great dude. Fred's a great dude. You know, B. Marshall's that guy too. And then I can talk my ass off. So yeah, we got together, man. I'm having a good time doing it. Man, that's what's up, man. That's what's up, man. I like I said, I appreciate it. And I like it. I like y'all show, man, because when we talked and I had asked you to come on mine, and I was like, hey, oh, man, I, I was excited. I, I said, hold up, man. Channing be holding out. <laughs> Channing didn't tell me he had a podcast coming through. And I, said, yeah. man, I sat there and watched it, man, the information that y'all giving. And y'all are all legends and y'all all right, man. And just to hear the things that are coming out your mouth, talking about truth, talking about when y'all was in the league, talking about the, the draft that just happened recently and then talking about you guys, the last episode was phenomenal. Just talk about what you guys are doing in the community in regards to B Marsh and, and with this, uh, you know, COVID-19 and, and just really understanding what the dynamics of what's happening in our country today. So, um, man, the reason I wanted to get you on here, man, the theme, if nobody knows, the theme tonight is about financial literacy. And so we're going to get to that towards the end. But I want to give our viewers, them that they may know a little bit about you, they know who you are, but, man, I was, based on I was doing my research, I said, hold up, I didn't know that your dad played in the NFL, man. I didn't have yep. a clue. Yeah, man, he was, man, Big Randy was a baller. Went to Penn State, man, three-time All-American, ended up getting drafted to the Dolphins. Me and uh, me and my dad ran out the first father and son not to play for the same team, but to get drafted for the same team. So, um, you know, that was an honor there. And then, you know, coming back to the Dolphins, the alumni base is so strong with the Dolphins that – now a bunch of guys that play with my dad, Nat Moore, who's very high up in the Dolphin organization, and, and just a bunch of different guys, Larry Little and all the guys that come back for the alumni weekends and things, they all know Pops. And, and so uh, it, was a, it was an easy transition because everybody kind of took me under their wing just because they were like, I got to watch out for, for, for my man Randy. So you little Randy, and uh, my real name's Randy. I'm real name's Dan Randolph. But I only go by, I only go by Randolph when I'm trying to make money because that sounds prestigious, you know, but I couldn't. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't ride through inner city Atlanta telling people to call me Randolph. Randolph. I <laughs> so I started to go by Channing. And, uh, but, yeah, man, my dad was already played in the league. And, um, you know, they have a lot of lineage in there, you know, and just, just understanding of the sport and all that stuff. But actually, my mom started me playing the game. 
gotcha. they got divorced when I was I was nine years old. They got divorced, and my mom got me playing the game. And then uh, wow. you know my you know my dad helped helped out. You know my dad taught me about some things, taught me certain things. But yeah, I got to get my. I say the three people I get credit for me making in the league is God, my mom, and Zach Thomas. Because wow. playing with Zach, Zach was a dog. Zach really taught me how to wow. uh, adjust to the game. But yeah, man, it was it was, it was pretty cool. Having uh being able to follow my father's footsteps, being able to follow the you know the the, the family and keep the name rolling to make yeah. Crowder mean something, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, make, absolutely. When Abs Crowder, it clicks <laughs> to him, so I'm, I'm proud of that. How long did he play in the league? Rand was in the league for eight years. Okay. He, yeah, he played for eight. Played three for the Dolphins. If you've seen Cocaine Cowboys, he got a little trouble. You know, Crowders are Crowders. We go Crowder go Crowder. So he got a little trouble legally. We got locked up for a second and then uh, went to the Buccaneers and played another five years up there. That's what's up, man. That's what's up. That's what's up. So, man, I want to talk about, you know, uh, I know we just had the NFL draft recently um, with guys getting chosen. And I'm watching it and I'm seeing parents, people's parents falling off the seats, falling out the couch, knowing that they are, their, their kids' lives are about to ch change dramatically. Um, tell us about, you know, your point of view in regards to the draft and then when you were drafted as well, coming out of Florida. Well, really, it was period with the draft, talking about the parents, bro, and, like, um, the expectations. Once you get drafted, you're just – that's a that's a foot in the door. Because you've seen uh, – everybody knows the Ryan Lee story, Jamarcus Russell. Dolphins just cut Charles Harris, who was drafted 22nd overall in the first round. Like, yeah. it, 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 it's a different monster, bro. I was an All-American in high school. I was 6'1", six, yes. six, 210 pounds in high school, knocking people's helmets off. And so I went to Florida. Started as a freshman, all SEC, all American, and then, you know, left as a sophomore. Like I it was, was a dog. Look, I already know you was doing the same thing in college, bro. In college, then I walked into this league, and I walked in when I walked into the league, big dog. The linebacking core was Zach Thomas, Jason Taylor, and Junior Seau. All three gonna be Hall of Famers. All Hall so, of Famers. So that kind of when I looked around the linebacker room the first day, I kind of like, yeah, this is a different monster here. And just playing against the Marshawns, the Paytons, the Bradys, the just all those guys, man, it's a different level. So that's the one thing, man. B people get all jacked up about being drafted. Only thing you should be jacked up when you get drafted, look on your slot and see what your guaranteed money is. That's it. That's it. Whatever your guaranteed contract is, because they will cut your ass, they will get rid of your ass so quick. Because this is a performance business, man. People, yeah. you you can't. I have I have coaches that I'm friends with still. Yeah, but it was more than football with them. But man, you are a commodity in the league. So that that's what a lot of these guys, you know, I think they they it doesn't click for them. A lot of guys talk about, oh, this, oh man, there's no loyalty. There's no loyalty. There's no loyalty in money. Making money is making money. If you that's ain't it. making money doing your job, if you're messing up, they are gonna stop paying you, man. So that's, that's the it. one thing when I do sit down, Kev, with the um with the I do the Dolphins symposium with the rookies, and I okay. explain that to them. Bro, people don't like you. They like what you do. What you do. You are the, Some of the best, I'll be honest, some of the best human beings, some of the most intelligent human beings, some of the greatest people, greatest fathers, greatest sons, greatest brothers, they were not the best players. They were good people. Yeah. But then they walk on that field and get their ass choked out, and they go back to the bench. <laughs> no matter how great you are as a human. So that's the thing, man. When you, when, when it's football, when you walk into that to that to that locker room, you walk out on that field, Kev. That's what these guys got to start understanding. There's no coach that told your mom he's gonna take over for her as your mentor. They're yeah, not into no. that. You no. are an employee there to do a job. Do a job. You're a receiver to do a job. And you can't catch. You're not receiver. Do a job. And you can't catch. You're not receiving anymore. They gonna cut you. You a quarterback you that can't throw. They gonna cut you. You a linebacker that can't tackle. They are gonna cut you. And that's, that, that's the thing I try to get into young guys' minds. When I do talk to, to um, yeah. younger players, bro, do your job. That's your number job. one. And friendship, do it well. Friendship is number 65 on the list. Do your job. Work hard. Grind. Be good with your money. You know what I'm saying? Make your circle small. Because if you, if, if you meet somebody after you get drafted, it's a good yeah. chance they wasn't going to be your friend if you didn't get drafted. Wow. Like, un understand, understand what you're here for and understand for. why they're giving you a million dollars a year plus. Like, leave yeah. minimum right now is what, six something, 650 or whatever yeah. it is. They're not giving you that money to be a great human. <laughs> what was the league minimum when you was playing? My first year, I made 237. And that was the league minimum. Yeah. And wow. I, well, I was jacked up. With about 17 grand a game, man, I was jacked up when I got that first check. 
That's real money now. Hey, man. Wait, so the years that you played for the Dolphins, man, I want you to talk a little bit about your career, man, and, and, and what you did here at the Dolphins. I know when you got here, and we met through uh, Paul Soliai yep. when he played here. Shout out to Paul and Tasha. And met through them, man. But you were a freaking beast when you played here at the Dolphins, man. A Appreciate beast. It. So, I mean, talk about how, you know, how did you feel about your career? Um, well, I, it, it was what it was. Like, you know, I came in. I was supposed to be a first round and all that. Like I said, All-American. and uh, But I got locked up three times in Gainesville fighting and all that, you know, just being young and dumb and not really knowing young how to turn the other cheek. Somebody say something <laughs> slick to me, I'm going to hit you. I, I don't know how to – me. I don't argue with men too much. Yeah. If you want to cuss me out, you start cussing, I was going to hit you. This is my prior life. So got some trouble, you know, went in the third round and just came down here, man. And, like, I wasn't supposed to be honest. I wasn't supposed to be drafted. I wasn't supposed to be All-American. I told my ACL in eighth grade. Wow. So wow. it was it was people telling me at that moment, like, yeah, you told your ACL, you're this young, it's gonna be tough for you to get back to a high level. So then I go in and I start balling again, go into my tenth grade season, tear my ACL again, and then play for a couple <laughs> seasons, ball out. In my senior year, the ACL I repaired retore, and then I told my other one while rehabbing my initial tear. So I had four ACL reconstructions in high school. Wow. So, wow. Even, so even but even when I went to UF, everybody was like, why would you go to a, a university like that? Like, those are the best of the best. I was like, bro, I'm the best of the best. I'm yeah, the best of the best. The, yeah, all the injuries and all. So even from that doubt. So now I go to Florida, play, you know, say, like I say, all SEC, all American, all that. And then I come out of come out of um come out of Florida. And even that when I went to the combine, there were coaches coming up to me like, man, why did you why did you come out? Like you know, you you are you, you think you're ready to play at the next level? I've watched your film, and just all that doubt, that doubt just fueled me. So when I every snap I went, and I know it's cliche, people say it, Kev, but every snap I went out, I would really be like, even in practice, game practice, whatever, bro, I'm not supposed to be up here. I'm supposed to be in Atlanta somewhere selling dope. Like I'm not supposed wow. to be where I am. Wow. So let me wow. go out here, and and my my thing as a linebacker was let them feel me, let every player I touch turn around and be like, man, what the hell is wrong with that dude? Like, this dude's crazy. And that's what I wanted to do. I really just wanted to – and even now, like, people don't be like, bro, you was a dog. You changed games and all that. Just, just to be honest, I'm no pro – I ain't go to no Pro Bowls, no Hall of Fame, nothing like that. Yeah. But, like, when I – like Fred, Fred T. Fred played play Fred T a couple times. Played Red, played B. Marshall. All the offensive players, Ronnie B, Ricky, and all them. When I talk to them to this day and we sit around talking about ball, they'd be like, bro, you should try to hit somebody as hard as you can every time you hit them. And that's that's what made me feel good, bro. When well, they were like, "Bro, you tried to bring it every snap, every every every, every snap, every snap." And that and that's that's where and that's why I took my pride in it because I had the underdog mentality my whole career, and yeah. that's what I went into it. So the on the field success with the Dolphins wasn't there. You know, we went to the playoffs in 08, and then Ed yeah. Reed killed all that with the Ravens. Two interceptions, ran one for a touchdown. He destroyed us in 08, but um. <laughs> Played decent, you know what I'm saying? Laid the dogs yeah. in tackles, I think, two or three years out of my you know, six years playing. And, and and like I said, made the crowd a name mean something. Like when yeah. I walk into when I walk into Twin Peaks, you know what I'm saying? When I go up to Funky Buddha Brewery and I my look my little hangout spot, like I walk in and people look and they have facial recognition of who I was. And that yes. means I really I put my face in their mind by on the field performance. And that that makes me feel good. That that does give me some pride in and Beating the odds first off the field, being you know having a single mother, living with you know a single mother raising three kids, wow. living in not wow. the best places and all, you know what I'm saying hurting my knee, getting the injuries, getting the arrest, and still being and still the being one, able, yeah, being the one percent of the one percent. But that one percent, some of those guys had the perfect life. I had a rough life and still became the one percent of one percent. So I got to say I'm the one percent of the one percent of the one percent. One percent of one percent of because of what I had to overcome off the field and yeah. also had to perform on the field. So I just take pride in in, in 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 knowing that whatever I did on the field, whatever I accomplished, you know, off the field philanthropy and all while I was down here, yeah. really made people understand. And like I said, keep the crowd name going. You know, people Absolutely. see me with my dad. They they'll look and be like, Is "This Randy Crowder." That's your dad? Like, they put it together and it comes to them like, damn, this is crazy. Both of y'all made it. Both of y'all played for the Dolphins. So, man, yeah, I, you know, like I said, I wasn't no pro bowler, 
but I, I hey, did my thing and I let you came here, you, me when I You came here, did your job and made a name for yourself. You know, yes, no, my, no minor the situation and the back, the back, uh, your your background story. You still came here and you did what you were supposed to do, and I love that because a lot of times you have a lot of people who have the opportunity and they don't seize it at all, yeah. at yes. all. So it happens um, all the time, man. all the time. <laughs> yeah, guys, um, wait for me. bro, I, I can list. I know we got list. I can list guys at every level that were better, faster, stronger, quicker, just better football players than me. But they couldn't overcome anything off the field. They couldn't overcome everything. Mentally, they couldn't get their grades right. They just they just had something in their life that stopped them from being great. Yeah. And even with my hurdles, I just kept jumping them damn hurdles. Jumping you them kept hurdles. Jumping. Until I hit, you know, hit and got my little third round money to hit again. And then I was the big hurdle when I hit. So then yeah, then, you know, then we set it up where I could have all this these shelves and shit and helmets behind me and all. But yeah, man, it it, it, it is. When I when I think back and you know what I'm saying, talking being asked in interviews and talking about it, do I do take pride in it? Nah, that's what's up, man. And I respect that. I mean, you had a one hell of a career. Um, my next question is talking about, you know, what propelled you to to make the decision to go into retirement after playing uh, six seasons? Well, the Dolphins actually released me. Yeah, they owe they owe me uh, what I think four and a half million dollars, something like that. They they talked to my agent about taking a pay cut, but it was going into the lockout year. Gotcha. And you had get you you. If your your contract was ending during the lockout year, if you had a good agent, some guys you know they got their cousins being their agent, but if if you have a good agent, then if your contract was up or the last year your contract was the was the lockout year, you had guaranteed money on the back end and the front end, and that's what Joe wow. Siegel, my agent, did. So I was already guaranteed, you know, saying you no know, one million, it was well into the six figures. I was already guaranteed that year. So when the Dolphins released me after taking a pay cut, and I was like, y'all owe me money. I'm not taking a pay cut. You already yeah. owe me money. Yeah, so you I, owe me I, money. I planned on taking a year off, and I was like, I'm gonna take a year off. They already released me. I don't, you know, say I don't, I don't wanna. Buffalo was calling me. Um, New England. I went up and visited New England. I was headed to Buffalo next. Seattle ended up calling me, and it was just too far. My wife was pregnant. My wife was nine months pregnant at the practice. She was at practice the day they released me, and she was nine wow. months pregnant. So wow. I got released on like on like August 10th, August 11th. My son was born August 29th. So with all that going on, knowing my wife was at home pregnant, I said, you know, I'm gonna take a year off. Wow. When I took that year off, I was still getting a check. I was good, Kev. And then I saw the other side of life, man. And that's that. That's what made me retire. And that's the that's the part I don't think people get is where when you're playing at that level, when you're yeah. walking out there every single day with the best football players in the history of the world. Yes. And guys like that playing Tom Brady, I believe he's the best quarterback of all. That. Playing that man twice a year, you know what I'm saying? You joke and laugh, have a good time, go party, whatever. But you put so much pressure on yourself to stay there. It yeah. took you so long to get there. But like we were talking about earlier, bro, you got to stay there now. So yeah. It was so much pressure to work out, so much pressure to keep this weight down, so much pressure to keep to get these injuries right, keep your knees strong, keep your feet strong, your ankles, your wrists. Um, learn the playbook. Watch the offense. Learn the, the, the transition, like when the RPOs and the game started changing, the spread stuff like Keep up with it. Like I would go watch high school and college games that I don't even care about just to see the 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 maturation of offensive coordinators' minds and see where football is going. Wow! All that pressure that I I didn't even know I was putting on myself when I took that year off. I was sitting at home one day. It was like I was like a Wednesday morning at about ten o'clock, and me and my wife just sitting watching TV. And I turned. I was like, Yeah, I'm gonna hang this thing up. I ain't playing no more. She was like, Okay, whatever. Cause she knew I love football. Like she knew yeah. I love football. So, she was like, yeah, whatever. You're gonna be back. I was like, man, it's uh, it feels too good not to not to have a coach, uh, a, a GM, a head coach, a DC, a, a linebacker, all calling you, worried about you, texting you, sending you videos and stuff you need to learn. And when I when I let that pressure get off my back, I felt like I was 250. I felt like I was 150 pounds. I just I just felt wow. better. I was a happier person. I was a, I was a, a better father. I can stay up all my son, you know, he's get waking up every two hours. I can tell my wife to sleep and be with my son all night. Not your son. About waking up for practice, man. It's just like that family life and, and just getting out of it. Like the transition, people ask me, actually, we're about to get on. Somebody just asked me, Crowder, do you miss the game? I miss the checks, but I don't miss the game. Like, <laughs> <laughs> bro, I, you know, I had 470 tackles, whatever, like, I, I I played the game for for a long time. Uh, yeah. Just double the league minimum, you know what I'm saying, or the league average. 
Average, yeah. Uh, so I played the game double the league average. Like, I played a lot of football, Florida, high school, all the way back when I started playing when I was 10. And that's like, a lot of years. People don't understand. That's a lot yeah. of years of, of playing organized football and smacking people consistently, yeah. year after Ret year. Retired when I was 27. The second I stepped into football at 10, I, I was always I always had a little butt wipe in me, so I was always playing defense. So I was hitting people. I was busting my head into people for 17 years of my life. And I was just like, nah, I got a family now. I got kids. If I didn't meet my wife, Asia, if she wasn't pregnant, if I was still a bachelor single dude, I might have played another two or three years. But with everything just on top, of it, on top of itself, and to be honest, like I tell everybody when I tell the story, if I didn't get my second contract, I wouldn't have hung it up because I would have still been chasing, like chasing uh, financial security, chasing, you know, chasing generational wealth that I'm trying yeah. to give my children. But <clears throat> once the money was decent, once, you know, I've kind of pro I proved myself that I could do this, you know, playing four years, getting another contract, playing another two, like, I kind of, I just say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm mentally, I was mentally ready and I was, and, and I have no regrets about that. I have no regrets about retiring. I have, my only regret about retiring is the year that I retired, Seattle called me and they asked me to come out there for a workout. They won the Super Bowl that year. So I don't even know if, I don't know if they would have signed me or whatever, but I'm just thinking, damn, if I went to Seattle, I could have backed up Bobby Carpenter, whoever the hell was there at the time. Yeah. And I might have had me a ring. You know what I'm saying? Like that <laughs> that's my regret of not not a, 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 a team that was thinking about signing me winning the Super Bowl because I never won a ring. And the same thing happened in Florida. I left in 05. They won yeah. the 2006 National Championship That's when Urban Meyer came in. Yes. So like, yeah. like that, that, those rings, the, the top level of co co college football is the championship. The top level of the NFL is the Super Bowl. And to be one or two steps away from a Super, uh, Super Bowl and a National Championship on both sides of my career, that's the only thing Like I think back and to be like, man, should I stay in college another year? Damn, sir, I played one more. I could have had a ring. But <laughs> other just just personal, personal me, yeah, but I was ready to hang it up. I think I did. I, I did enough. I proved enough to myself. I think I proved enough to the world. To the world. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. So my next question, I think you already answered this with just talking about the transition process that took place uh, regarding you just thinking about life after sports. And, and you said it already, just my family. You know, I, I did everything that I needed to personally to do, and I think I got everything I needed to get out of football. Um, now that I could be able to take care of my family the way that I want to. Um, so my next question is we talk about our theme being uh, financial literacy. Um, tell us how you were able to set yourself up financially for retirement while you were playing. I know you, I know you talked about it briefly on your, yeah. on your podcast. And yeah, I said I yeah. definitely have to talk, ask you about it because I just think it was a great, a great way of how you were talking about it. So explain to our viewers. Yeah, man. It's... um. It's a thing where you really got to know what a dollar is on both sides. You got to know what a dollar is when you make it. And at the NFL level, you're going to be on the highest tax bracket. Because like I said, the league minimum now is 650000 That's the high tax bracket. We way past the high tax bracket. Yeah. So every dollar you make is really about $0.65. Cents. You know, different presidents, it might be closer to $0.70. Cents. So every dollar you make, you make about $0.70. Cents. So now when I, first, when I got my first million-dollar check, I remember Obama was in office, and I had a big old Obama stick on the back of my back of my truck and all. So we buy, but the, but the percentages change, you know what I'm saying? So they owe me a million. I know I'm getting my million that day. I walk in, they give me a check for six hundred thirty-five thousand. Blows my mind. I was like, bro, where's where's the rest? Cause y'all owe me a million dollars. Where's the rest of my money? And then I look at it, and it's in FICA and Social Security and all that lineup shit where they took 300 racks out of my pocket. But a lot of guys, and that's one thing I explain to a lot of guys, too, that's the front end of a dollar. The front end of a dollar is really 70 cents, 65, 70 cents. Then the back end of a dollar, not what a dollar can buy, but what a dollar can make you, how much a dollar's worth, how much a dollar costs. And that's the thing, too, that me and Brandon Marshall laugh about because I, I signed my deal, which what, Brandon just signed a $40 million deal. And I was telling Brandon, I was like, be Marshall, bro. What, if I get the $5 million, I'm set. He was like, you set? I'm like, bro. And I, like, when I explain, I explain it quick there, but I'd be like, every million is $50,000 for the rest of your life. If, you, if a financial advisor can't make you 5% on your money, even right now, like what's going on right now with the market and all, you should have been making 8 or 9%, 7% at the lowest in the last couple of years. 
so that when a recession does hit, if it goes down to 3%, that's going to average out back to above five. Yeah. So every million dollars is $50,000 a year is what wow. I tried to explain to guys. So if you can get the three million dollars, do the math, 150 racks a year, and that's people giving you your money to let them hold it. That's that's hard money loan. I ain't gonna get into everything, but hard money loans, real estate, just so many different ways where people will, if you have hard cash, people will borrow it at 10% rates. You know, five or better always. I'm never getting anything under five in anything I do unless yeah. I'm borrowing money, then I gotta get it below four. Cause now you gotta make you gotta make that. You got to make that that, that that difference. If you're going to make five, you can't hey, borrow it for five. Because hey, make straight businessman. I see you with the straight business terminology already. <laughs> so if you want my money, it got to be over five. If I want your money, I ain't got but three and a half, big homie, whatever. You know. <laughs> under four like, percent. Yeah, you give me under four. And then funny thing right now, anybody out there that owns a house, if you can refinance right now, you can get some great rates because nobody's spending money because no, you know, people are struggling. So yeah. now people are trying to give away money. The Fed took the rate down right now. You can get you can get some refinances at two percent right now, two and a half. Like you can do some real things right now, if you're in the situation, obviously, to be able to do that. But I just, I just, I always, I always thought like I was talking about earlier. I, I always played like it was my last snap. Yeah. So I approached the money that same way. Like the same way. At the end of the year, end of my first year, I, whatever. Let's say I had half a million. I had five hundred. My mind was. This 500 has to last me forever, or at least set me up to do something else. Yeah. And then when I got the next year, let's say I got the eight or 900. Okay, well, I got 900. I never said, okay, I'm going to hit this bit. Okay, I'm going to have 10 million, 20 million dollars one day. Let me go spend. And I have my habits, bro. My whole, I, used, I used to go to. Dollars. Once my, once my, I would tell my buddy knew, once my rack is gone, crowd yeah. is gone. If I get up and leave, my buddy be like, oh, he done spent a thousand. He's out of here. Man, that, I, was look. My, that was my rule. <laughs> I ain't, you hey. see these dudes? Hey, your rule was 1,000. 1,000. That's it. You see these dudes buying 20 bottles at Lil V? <laughs> that's 10 racks. Hey, and that's you like, got to tip the lady. And you and you're going to buy food. And you're going to buy some little wines and champagne for the little devils and dabbles that walk up. Ain't no way in the hell I'm about to spend 10 racks at a club. <laughs> So even that where when I played, I enjoyed myself to the fullest. But I always had a budget. Everywhere I went, I had a budget. Yeah. I've never bought a new car in my life. Never purchased a wow. new car. Wow. Do off, you guys off, hear that? Off lease. I'm going to get that 30,000 miles on it, get 10, 15,000 knocked off of it. It's going to be a pretty car. It's going to yeah. be nice. And I, I didn't – I think the thing that saved me too financially, Kev, is I'm, it's materialistic, but I, don't, I didn't want to impress anybody physically. Like, yeah. I didn't want to have a big $200,000 chain on. Because the women that talk to you are going to be gold diggers. The dudes that hang around you are going to be gold diggers, too. Diggers. That's one thing people don't know. There's men gold diggers out there. <laughs> or, bro, or you're going to get robbed. You're going to get robbed, bro. I, done, I had, I had, a, I had a, a 8, 19. I was born in 1983. So when I was young and dumb, I bought a, it was about 50000 after everything was done with it. 1983 Monte Carlo SS. Yeah. I, bought, I bought 11 alligators. Cause I wanted I wanted alligator skin interior in my car, but they were like, "Hey, there's there's leather, you know, form." I was like, "No, no, no! I want to sit on an alligator's back. If a girl gets in the car, I want the tail of the alligator running down the butt crack. Like I wanted alligator skin." Well, you crazy? So, so the dude told me he was like, "Well, you gotta go. You gotta buy the alligators from California. You wow. gotta get them killed. You gotta get the, them skins. You gotta get the skin dyed. You gotta get it. I want it orange. You gotta get it dyed orange. You gotta like, spend eleven thousand dollars or." It's eleven thousand dollars. Seven alligators. I bought seven alligators for eleven thousand dollars. So just so I could take the skin off and put them in the car. I was so terrified to drive that car because the, out of the first fifteen times, twenty times I took it out, twice I almost got robbed. Wow! Somebody was following me home one time. Another time yeah. I was going around a roundabout, and it was a car right next to me. You know, you're going around a little roundabout to get on the highway. Yeah. The car was right there with me. Right there. I'm not paying no attention. I had I had four four W twelves in the back. I, I had in the back. <laughs> you, had, you had them twelves beating, boom, the, boom. Yeah, beating there. So I'm just riding, listening to my music, and the car is right next to me, right there next to me. So I end up looking over, and there's a 38 point out the window. And dude wanted me like, it's like pull over. She's like hey, he wanted he wanted to whip. So wow. I'm riding, and I start slowing down and come around the corner. So he starts slowing down, but then I look, and he was in a Taurus. I had 480 horsepower in that damn Monte Carlo. 
I ain't no way he gonna catch me if I hit this damn gas. So we got off that turnabout and I hit it. Yum! And then damn, I saw the little bitty lights. Cause listen, you ain't gonna catch nobody calling on no tourist kid. And that was the thing. So then another time, almost got robbed at a gas station. And uh, I had, you know, I walked in, walked. I saw the dude standing there, holding, you know, what I'm saying, hiding behind the bushes or whatever. So I came out real loud, yelling and screaming, like acting crazy. And I guess I scared him. He was probably a crackhead, but I guess I scared yeah. him. And he, you know, he ran off. So after that, like that kind of solidified in me where not, bro, I don't need no nice stuff, man. Yeah. <laughs> Look, hey, in the years, hey, Chris, uh, Channel, the years that I've known you. I've never seen you with chains. I've never seen you. I've never seen you been no type of flashy type of guy at all, ever, ever. No. <laughs> it ain't no, what, what's my thing? And I ask people this all the time. And the answer I get is it makes me happy. Because I always ask them, why do you need a $200,000 chain? Oh, uh, I said, what you want? If you need to get a woman. So if you, you need a $100,000 chain to get a woman, bro, you ain't got There's no a game. You ain't got no game. <laughs> so then I said, no, it makes me happy. So you have to have on 75 diamonds to make yourself happy. Happy. That's a that, problem. That's the dumbest thing in the world. So, that, that's a problem. That's yeah, a problem. So even, even everybody has a vice. And even my even yeah. my vices I kept down. So yeah. that's a part of understanding the dollar where, like, you can have fun, but set a, set a, set a, set a limit on it. Yeah, you wanna, so, you yeah I, I out, agree. Say $1,000. Say you want $1,000, $500, whatever your number is. Set a limit on it. And that's what I did while I was playing. Even when I got my second deal, like a lot of guys, when they do get a little money, they want to, then they, oh, okay, well, I was making 17000 a game. Now I'm making 150000 a game. So now I got to spend more money. Why? Didn't Why? you enjoy them? Didn't you enjoy the, that time? Just keep yeah. enjoying it like that. Yeah. And then, on, and then on the back end of knowing what a dollar is and the investments, where I always looked at, I looked at every dime I had as 5%. So when I got my, when I, when I had a million in my bank account, that's fifty thousand dollars. I got fifty thousand that I can spend for the rest of my life a year. Life. Then two was a hundred. Then three yeah. was one fifty. And that's how I looked at it. Where now you can really live the lifestyle you have for the rest of your life. And then the other thing too was I was getting a job. A lot of dudes wanted. Huh, I ain't gonna get no job. I'm gonna get a record producer. I'm gonna buy a restaurant. No, I went and got me a damn job with insurance. And I got a second 401k. I maxed out my 401k in the league. They were sending me money back like, Mr. Crowder, you can't give us this much money. We can't, we can't match it. Don't match it. Just put it in my 401k. Just put it with my 401k. Put all the money in there because I want to get me another five, six million dollars when, when I'm 55 so I can ball again. But I always, I always thought about the future. And I don't yeah. know if it was seeing my dad playing the league and not really have, they didn't make much back then, but he, you know, he he got him a job. He worked for the city of Tampa. He was, you know, a mortgage guy and all for a while. But I just saw so many guys, and then you see Billy Corbin's broke. You just see all them dudes. And I just said to myself, yeah. I was like, I don't ain't no be way I'm going to be that guy. Ain't no way I'm going to yeah. make 50 million and be broke. Ain't no way I'm going to make 4 million and be broke. So yeah. I always approach it as the future. If yeah. I have this now, can I have this in 10 years? Can I have this in 20 years? Can I have this in 40 years? And a lot of yeah. guys can't think that way. A lot of, a lot of human, not even ball players now, Kev. A lot of human beings. Human can't beings think can't think that way. They can't no. think twenty years down the road. And that's that's what I got blessed with. I think you know yeah. my mom. She she used to hold my money for me and have a little book. My mom had a little book that I used to write. Like I'll cut the grass instead of giving me ten dollars. I put plus ten in my book. Now I got three hundred eighteen dollars. And I just had. I'm talking about. I was eleven, twelve years old, and I had this book. And it was like a bank account book. So then if I wanted to buy something, hey, mom, I want a bike. She's like, well, you got, how much money you got? How much money do I owe you? I'd be like, well, I got $410. Okay, the bike's $100. Okay, now you got $310. I get it yeah. for you. So like just, my mom always put just the thought of what a dollar was in the mind. What a dollar was. And, and that was just at an early age. And, and it, it yeah. is at, as you've gotten older, it has helped you. Just understanding that. Understanding the, the value of the dollar. Yeah. You know, um, and, talking and, about. And, and also, the last thing, Kev, also. What does make me happy is security. Like with a time like that, a chain, having a chain on is only going to make me paranoid because if I if I saw me walking around with a chain on, i try to rob me. Be like, how much that chain? i rob the hell out of myself. So I'm like, no, but the thing that makes me happy is right now. With, with what's going on right now, the quarantine with the COVID, with the, the economy yeah. and all, where we're still good. Yeah. Where if we had 10, 15 cars in the driveway, do we got to go sell the cars? You know, do we got to dump some real estate projects? Do we have to dump some houses that we own, some of our investments? You know, my wife, she has the Airbnbs, and we do a lot of real estate stuff. 
we don't have to dump anything because we do everything intelligent where it's set and how we do it. It's always, there's something paying off everything. It's always yeah. a moving part. It's always a plan. It's not just let's buy it. Let's plan on it. If it takes an extra two weeks, an extra two months, plan on it. And plan then you can it. always yeah. have it. If you jump into it, you don't know when it's going to leave. Get into it fast, leave fast. Play it slow, you get out slow. I like that. I like that. Y'all, I hope y'all listening. We have some high school people on here, some college athletes that are listening. I hope y'all listen to this, to this advice. My next question, right? It, we talked about future. I wanted to hear what would be your advice uh, that you would give professional athletes uh, regarding financial decisions that can help them in the future. Like what advice would you, would you give them that are currently in the league? I have a no man. Have somebody tell you, you can't do it. No, no. Hey, I'm about to, I need, I need 40 racks. I'm about to shoot the Vegas with my boys. That's going to no. mess up your off season. No, no. I can see you 15. I can see you 10. You're not getting 40. You got to have a no man because money becomes, yeah. it, it becomes monopoly money. I'll be yeah. honest. I've hung out with enough dude. Bro, I done, I done seen $50,000 in ones on the table in strip clubs just hanging out with different people. I done seen dudes with two hundred eighty, three hundred fifty thousand dollar markers at, at at Vegas club. I mean Vegas casinos. When the when they walk in the door, they bring them two hundred racks in chips, and they go to the table, start playing, and they take their bags to the room, and they like I've I've seen it all, and I call it monopoly money. I no never think about this as monopoly money. Yeah. Never think about it like that. Always have somebody to bring you back down to earth when you do have. And everybody says that. But if I had a million dollars, I'd be set. If you had a million dollars, you'll start acting like you have a million dollars. Million dollars, yeah. If you're if you if you get a million dollars, can you continue? Can you stay in your same house? Could you drive your same car? Could you eat the same places? You know what I'm saying? Could you could you wear the same jewelry or no jewelry? Could you wear the same shoes? Bro, people can't do that. And that's no. the thing I beg these guys to do, bro. Just be yourself. Don't let money change you. Money yeah. doesn't change people, it makes them worse than it brings the worst out of them. Yeah. Because now they feel special. So, B, like you're saying, back to your initial question. If I had to give uh, 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 advice to athletes, first thing, have a no man. I have a dude, I'm with Merrill Lynch right now. His name is Alex Alexis. And he gives me the real. Because I come, no. bro, how much I lost? How much money we lost with this, what's going on right now with this market? Well, you know, you, most people lost 20. I think you're down about eight. I said, yeah, man, don't send me that money this month. Keep it. Keep it. Leave it invested. <laughs> I don't want it. <laughs> well, you okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got my little job. Just leave. You know what I'm saying? Well, I just be like, no, we don't need you know, extra five grand, whatever it is. Just leave it. Leave it in the yeah. market. Let it grow because it's gonna swing. And everybody pull their money out. They're not gonna have it now. They sold. They're not low. gonna have it. Yeah. You want to sell high? You want to buy low? So actually, right now you should be buying stocks because the stock market is down. It's, it's it's coming back up now. But it's coming back up now. You yeah. should have you should have bought early last month because everybody panicked when it was headed this way, and then the it's bell curve hits. When you see that curve about to turn, you buy there. Because it's going to go back up. Back, go back up. I don't know this, bro. I dropped out of college. I live as a sophomore. I got 36 credits at the University of Florida. <laughs> but I, I'm around enough smart people, and I hire enough smart people. And when they talk, all I do is listen. Yeah. I see the financial means is just listen to them talk. Hell, yeah, the market's this, and this, and it'll do. It's just like 2008 when the last time it cracked. You just sit and listen, listen, and you'll learn stuff. A lot of guys don't. don't they, they really don't want to learn because you're in a situation you don't want to learn. So you don't want get to a learn. no man, have a financial advisor that you listen to, and that's your let tell you no. Yeah. If you go spend a hundred thousand dollars a month, you're gonna be broke, sir. Just like <laughs> what, Antoine Walker, all the stories you've heard. The yeah, you heard. Broke, bro. You go, you gonna lose it if you go crazy. A lot of people go crazy. <laughs> well, do you think that in regards to that question, do you think or that statement that you made, do you think it's just that? players don't want to listen or they don't want to educate themselves because like you said you didn't finish college and it had nothing to do with finishing college is that you were thirsty for information so the people that were around in your circle that you hired you told them i want to i need to be in this meeting i need to listen to what you guys are doing and i need to understand the language because there's a different language when we're talking about financial literacy i need to understand what does this mean and so do you think that guys are guys want to learn the information or you think they just look i'm paying you to do the job and i don't really i don't care about it that um i don't think they, well i think they don't want to learn but i think it's just immaturity yeah it's where you never you know you've never had it. it's almost like the guy that you know uh the new father that just doesn't know how to change the diaper doesn't know but doesn't take the time to learn you know what I'm saying doesn't take the time to 
know to wipe, and then you got to, you know, go from the boot. You got to, the girls, you got to go from the front to the back because you can't wipe the poo-poo towards the little tata. All the stuff you got to learn when you're a dad. Like, a lot of guys, they just, they're just too immature or don't want to learn. Learn, because there yeah. are people out, Bro, when you, when you get in the league, you, there are people everywhere because they want to cut. If it's a half a percentage, but it's a half a percentage yeah. of a million dollars, that's decent money for, you know what I'm saying, as a job, whatever it is. A lot of guys are too immature to learn, and then what? I'm bro. I'm telling you, because first, my first my first check ever was my signing bonus. I signed my first check was five hundred eighty eight thousand dollars, and so they gave it to me. And I went and sat in the truck. I smiled. When I got it, I'm smiling, and the boys are around the locker room. And I get in the truck, bro, and I start crying. I called my mom. I called wow. my sisters. I'm just like, this, you know, what I'm saying this is stupid money. This is crazy, and it's one, and it's a hard check. Now this is paper, bro. I'm yeah. sitting there with half a million dollars in my hand. Went to the bank. The little, the little lady at the teller, she always act funny towards me. And then she saw that check. And she's going to smile, sit up in her chair. Hey, Mr. Kai, <laughs> no. Not now, Lydia. No, don't start it now. You told her, sit back. Sit you back. You funny when I was putting these $500 checks in. Now I got this 500000 Now you want to smile. No, I don't want to smile at you. But it, it, bro, it, 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 does, it does make you feel different. It makes you feel special and yeah. different and i i have money that nobody in my family's family's family family most guys to be honest no one's seen a million dollars the the world majority of the world no one's seen a million dollars i tell you when i signed my second deal my agent called me and i was upset i wanted a five-year deal to just get more guaranteed money but i had all the injuries so the dolphins didn't want to give me a five they gave me a three-year deal so i was kind of upset but i still signed the deal it was good money the annual yeah. annual breakdown was decent money so my agent called me. He was like, congratulations, you're in the top 4% of the world. I said, what? He said, with, with just the money you're making this year, you're a top 4% earner in the world. Wow. And I sat back and thought about it. And that kind of humbled me. A lot of guys would jack up. <laughs> I'm top four? She said, I need a Maserati. I need a Bentley. I need a million dollar high. I need all this. It kind of it scared me almost. Yeah. So just kind of bring your last question, next question together. Is how as how guys react when they see that money because you're gonna see that money even the, the seven round picks this year if they make the roster the after the first game on that Tuesday they're gonna get a direct deposit of thirty thousand dollars into their account and the next week thirty thousand and the next week thirty thousand and the next week thirty thousand at some point you're gonna be like yeah let me go get some why would why would I invest it. Why would I? Why would I? Why would I take this three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars and give it to somebody to put into a stock market or buy bonds or yeah. do hard money loans or to buy real estate or buy that, bro? This is my cash I earned. I'm about yeah. to spend this money. There's a lot of guys. I I would say the bigger answer. It's it's more it's more in your window towards a little more context, but I think it's just immaturity. Immaturity, yeah. If, and, if yep. I got in the league right now. I would have saved so much money if I had my 36 year old mind when I was 21. Yeah. But, but that's the problem. You have the 21 year old mind when you're yeah. 21. When you're 21 and you're going to do 21 year old things. So it's, it's, it's just a tough thing. Yeah. Um, going to my next question, man, in regards to uh, life after sports for you. And uh, I wanted to know how, how did you get into radio and uh, tell us about your involvement with 560 AM? Yeah, I do the, the, the media. Like you said, I have the I Am Athlete podcast, uh, YouTube. You show on my Instagram, my Twitter, all that. I put stuff out there. But the I Am Athlete podcast, my wife's real estate, Asia Crowder, AJA Crowder. She does a thing, re commercial, residential, investment, all that. And I am a client of my wife. We, yep. have, we have a number of investment properties. We have a couple of Airbnbs. She went to one today to check on it. We're getting the pool redone. Like, I'm, I'm my wife's client as well. And then the... um. The Hawkman and Crowder Show, 560 and 790. We're simulcast now, South Florida, on okay. both radio stations. But it was funny where when I was playing, I used to just mess with people. Kev, you, like you said, we used to hang out. Like, yeah. you know, bro, I just go. I just talk. I just mess with I'm trying, I'm trying to keep it PG right now because hey, I don't know hey, you do it. Hey, you doing a, you doing one heck of a job, man. I just want to let you know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So everybody knows if we ever have an un... Uh, uh, <laughs> A damn uncensored podcast. It'll be a lot. It'll be a lot different because I I cuss cuss, but I'm keeping a lot. PG because I don't know who's on here. I don't know who's listening. But so I used to just mess around. Anybody walking the locker room, I was on them. Coaches, players, 
uh, media member. I was on them, just, 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 we used to call it riding, whatever it's called. I was on them. <laughs> so then um, it was Channel 10 at the time. They came, they approached me 2000 and, well, I, sorry, 11, so 2009. And they were like, hey, can we film you? That's yeah. like, you know, funny thing, quick story. That's how me and Paul Soli, I got cool because they didn't want me sitting by a lot of people because I would influence dudes because I would either break their spirit by making fun of them so bad or they would just hear me going crazy and cussing and snapping. I used to have a, um, I used to have a store in my locker where I used to sell stuff because guys yeah. would be like, hey, Crowder, you got some dip, you got candy, you got chips. So I'd yeah. go to Costco's and buy a bunch of stuff, have it in my locker, but I would sell it for like a four or 500% profit. I used, to sell bags, I used to sell bags of chips for $7, the little bitty ones for $7. I used to sell cans of dip for 20 I used to burn CDs and sell them. Like, I had a little store in my locker. So they, so the coaches uh, didn't want me to, to negatively affect the young guy. So they put yeah. me next to Paul Soli. It's not because he was a D lineman and I was a linebacker. It was because he didn't speak good English, and they thought I couldn't really affect him because Paul was just so laid back. <laughs> and then Paul ended up loving me. I, I'm cool. I still talk to Paul to this day. Paul, my yeah. dude, dude. Hey, and I think Tasha, I got Tasha got in. She's in the uh, she's in the chat, so I think she hears us too. I saw her saying yeah. hello in there. <laughs> yeah, when Paul got when Paul came up from Utah, Paul, hello, hello. How he wouldn't say a damn word. <laughs> so that's why they put me right next to Paul. So they were like, "Well, Paul ain't gonna say nothing to him. He gonna sit by the wall and Paul, and we can keep him in his corner." But then the um, so then. Channel 10, I want to say, came up to me. It was like, hey, man, you just sit in this corner and talk trash all day. Do you mind if we film you? I said, yeah, no yeah. problem. They had to get through, cut through the Dolphins. And they called it Crowder's Cracks, where at the end, where the, when the credits were running on the news, yeah, they would put me up. Instead of playing, you know, the little dun, 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 dun yeah. BS music, they would just put me up talking and making fun of people. And they would edit it out, take all the cuss words out. So then they put that there. So then the following year, my last year playing, 2010, they asked me, they were like, hey, uh, 560 approached me and was like, hey, would you want to do a, a, a Monday night show because Tuesday's your day off and just kind of wrap up the week, you know, saying we've seen, you know, we see you, we see you like to talk, you know, we'll have your co-host and talk. And I was like, yeah, you know what I'm saying? They said they paid me out. You know, I'm going to chase a dollar now. You get me, you offer me a check, I'll chase me a dollar. So I was like, yeah, we'll pay you a little something. But I said, cool. So I started doing the radio on Monday nights. Then it turned into Monday and Friday nights. So wow. I just started growing in the business. And once, when I retired, there was a guy that had to decide between TV and radio. He was the afternoon, he was the, the midday uh, host. And he yeah. got a TV offer. So they he, they wouldn't let him do radio and TV at the same time. At the same so time. He quit. And they were like, hey, we need somebody to fill in. Can you just fill in for a couple weeks until we find a replacement? So I went and filled in with Adam Cooperstein. And I want to say a month or two later, it became the Coop and Crowder show. And then I was, that was my year off. So I was like, yeah, I have a little something to do, run to the station for a couple hours. Yeah. And then when I really decided to hang it up, then I just kept growing. Coop left. I got with Hawkman. And now it's Hawkman Crowder. We've been doing that now for going on five years, afternoon That's five, seven, six, five, six, and seven ninety. But it's just the thing a lot of guys don't do, man, is just capitalize on opportunity. People love you already. Like they do. They people do. People love you. But when when I'm out, like I talk to everybody. I yeah. just BS with people. You don't know who these people are. I'm telling you, the richest dudes, they have on boat shoes that are sitting at the end of the bar by themselves. And they be quadrillionaires. No yeah. jewelry, looking all frumpy and silly. Yeah. And they just, they, bro, they run the world. But they just, yeah. you want to, I, I tell you this, this. This is some of the best advice I ever got. Tiki Barber. Told you this. Tiki Barber told me this. And it was one of the smartest things I ever heard. Like, we were talking about something about regret. No, he was on the show. And he said, one of my, he's like, one of my only regrets in life is I used to try to hang with the cool kids. I should have been hanging with the smart kids. Wow. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, that, that, yeah. That, that, that statement hit me. Because the think about where the cool kids are from your high school. Think about where yeah. the cool kids are from your college. You don't want that me to tell you where they are. Bro, they're hall monitors. They're hall monitors back at their high school. Right now. What about the lame kids that were in class an hour early talking to the teacher? You know who that is? That yeah. damn Jeff Bezos and the Zuckerbergs and all them. Why would you not hang with the smart kids? To learn something, to better your life, but everybody yeah. wants to hang with the cool kid. And that was, that was some of the best advice I've heard somebody. Some of the best, the the the, the most intelligent way I've heard put it, yeah. where you have to think bigger picture than, oh yeah, oh yeah, he got the apartment where everybody party at. He ain't gonna be worth a damn. You what you yeah. three years, three years of hanging with this dude is not gonna do anything for you. Not at all. And it's not like everything. Like it's not like friendships don't mean nothing. 
Yeah. But grow friendships with people that have your same interest at heart. Yeah. And, and they want you to grow. They want you to grow. They want you to grow as well. Where yeah. I've, I've cut off a lot of people where um, one year in my career, I stopped partying. I was just like, man, I'm. Pete, let's be honest. When your contract's up and you want their money, then you change the way you're going to do so. I wanted to be, because I, I was going to get that sack sack. So I'm like, my year, my fourth year, I said, you know what? I'm going to stop partying this much. I'm going to chill. This, was this for second contract? This was for my second contract. Oh, that's so, the big one. That's the big one. So <laughs> my, I went through the first three years. I was part. I was playing, starting, you know what I'm saying? I, I yeah. was exactly. If I, if I, got, I, was, I was leading the team in tackles. And I was like, you know what? This is my last year. Let me chill out. Let me relax. Let me get on a meal plan. Let me get a stretch guy. Let me get a, 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 a what is it, a damn acupuncture. I hired all these damn people because I'm going to tighten up and I'm going to chill out. And then some of my buddies I used to party with all the time, go to the strip club, go to South Beach, where they would call me. They're like, bro, let's hit it. And I would explain to them, I'm like, bro, I'm going to chill out this year because I'm, I'm going to get this check. Yeah. Man, man, you acting different. You acting funny. Yeah, for this yeah, for this check, I'm going to I'm going to behave myself and and try to align what I'm trying to do so I can get paid. So I so I can set up and this is before I even met my wife, but so I can set up my kids kids. Like Yeah. You're thinking about going out on what is it? April what is it? April 1st, May 1st? Like May 1st, May 1st. going out on this on if we were, you know, out of quarantine on a Friday night. The fun we're going to have tonight. I don't give a damn what we do. That's yeah. not that's not gonna make me as happy as knowing when I die, my children's children are gonna have something to get yeah. passed down to them. Like, think that's about more that. Important. So that trans that that those situations, I lost a lot of friends off that where even when I chilled, I must have lost a half dozen, dozen friends off. Hey bro, let's hit it, right? I'm, I'm gonna chill for a little bit. Well, damn, man, it's like that shit, man. You acting funny, you acting different. Bro, you don't understand getting that getting paid like goddamn. So that that that's the part of just really the maturity. I matured. Speaking about yeah. what we were talking about earlier, Kev. Yeah. My rookie year, I'd had nothing, none thought of that. Yeah. They just gave me five hundred eighty-eight thousand dollar check. <laughs> I'm about to have me a ball in Miami. <laughs> but then, as I'm 22, 23, 24, Four. 25, it just slowly started going. Zach Thomas, like I brought up earlier, Zach Thomas started talking to me a lot. He was always talking to me. I just wasn't listening. Yeah. And then when I got <laughs> older, then I started listening. Listen. Uh, Jason Taylor started talking to me. Ronnie Brown. Ronnie's a very intelligent dude. And that was my yeah. guy guy. Ronnie started kind of, hey, bro, let's chill out this Friday. But we'll go, let's chill out Saturday. Bro, right, right. We'll go out Friday, but let's chill Saturday. Yeah. But he just started slowly pulling back. And I just, I listened. I was open enough to listen to the men I respected and the, the strong men, the yeah. real men, not the parties, not the guys that get all the girls. Those aren't the real men. Yep. The men that know how to handle business and really understand what life is. And I just started to mature and understand that. And it helped me out in the long run. I didn't know yeah. then that I would be where I am now or that I would understand what I understand now. But yeah. I'm a, I'm not a, I don't go to church that much, but I'm spiritual. Like, I, I know it's somebody watching out for me upstairs. Amen. And I think that was, that, that was the path that he put in front of me to take to learn yeah. what, I need, what I needed to go through, I went through, so I could be where I am as a 36-year-old. Yeah. Well, man, I look, I, I think just overall your career and the things that you've done off the field, I think this has been tremendous. I mean, like I said, you're not always the, the guy to be like, hey, let me get in front of the camera. Everybody needs to know what I'm doing. But trust me, I know the work that you and your wife have been doing behind the scenes. And my last question is just talking about, you know, what type of philanthropy uh, that you've been involved with. And I know I know personally what you've been doing, but I want you to let them know, you know, let the world know what, what you've been doing in regards to your philanthropy. And I know fishing is a big thing for you, yeah. so I'm going to let you talk about <laughs> it. But go ahead, man. Yeah, I do a lot with the Boys and Girls Club, Kev, as you know, but out to there. But I do a lot with the Boys and Girls Club. Right now, it's messing up. I actually had a, I had a football camp that I've done. This would have been the eighth year at the Boys and Girls Club. Would have been next weekend where we bring 60 or 70 kids in. I bring in a bunch of ex-teammates. Langford's been there. Kenyon Drake came. Zach came a year. There's a bunch of my ex-teammates come over. Yeah. JT came. And we just kind of, like, we'll do football drills, but it's really just to talk to us. We eat lunch with them. We talk to them about life, talk to them about grades and stuff, and just try to do that. I, I do a fishing camp. I mean, a, fish, uh, a fishing tournament for the Boys and Girls Club. We raised a, a bunch of money for them with the uh, advanced fishing tournament we did with them. A uh, toy giveaway every Christmas. Um, I get listeners from my radio show to come out and bring toys. Me and my friend Shaker Reddy from the Gumaconda Reddy Foundation. 
I do okay. a lot for his charity. He does a lot for my charity. So me and him together buy about four thousand dollars worth of toys, wow. and then we get a bunch of listeners bring stuff out. So we got tables of toys, and these underprivileged kids they walk in the boys and girls club and see toys piled to the roof. Some of them start crying. We get wow. gift cards. We give the parents, you know, probably it's you know forty twenty twenty to forty dollars to buy buy a meal. We get a kid yeah. a toy. We have ice cream there. We have all kinds of stuff for the kids just to make them feel good. And I, um, I'm a defensive coordinator at university school. I do all the football camps for the younger kids because I just want to help them guys, man. And I do more of talking like this to them than coaching them. I yeah. coach the hell out of them now. I yell and scream. My wife thinks I'm crazy. But <laughs> I just want to, like, explain to them, you know, saying, like, bro, I made it. I did everything you want to do. Yeah. Just, like, grind. I tell them about the work. I tell them yeah. about the, 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 the grades and stuff, how every, everything's together. You can't just play yeah. ball now. Back in the day, bro, I ain't going to lie to you. Back in the 80s, you could really just play football, and they would push you through. Bro, yeah. everything that's tightened up now. Like you yeah. have to have you have to have the grades, you have to be at a ball, you gotta stay out of trouble. Like trouble, yeah. It's overall. So I kind of try to tell them that. So it's um it, it's a it's a passion of mine more the coaching and, and, and the fishing and just passion of mine that I were, was able to take a passion and intertwine it with some kids and intertwine it with the philanthropy. So yeah. coaching, I love it, and I can also yeah. help kids while coaching, and I can do fishing tournaments and fishing camps <laughs> and just kind of take what I love to do and just be around young people. And people. just, you know, if I probably, I don't know, camp eight, you know, what, eight, it was, it was, uh, 600 kids, probably seen 600 kids in my football camp. If I change one, if I, if one of those kids think different about life. Yeah, you did your job. 600, I did my job. You did your job. I had, I, every time, and people make fun of me all the time, every time I see a kid, I ask them how, I say, how you marks? And marks mean grades. This country is hell. Yeah. But I'd be like, how you marks, man? How you marks doing, man? How you going to the schoolhouse? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'd be like yeah. that. And I say it to every single kid I see. Every, I mean, how your school work? How's your grades? Uh, I got a couple A's, B's, and a C. Get your C up. I yep. deal with all A's and B's. You know what I tell them? I deal with all A's and B's. And I've been doing that for years, Kel. I'm yeah. talking about over 10 years. Wow. And about three, four years ago, mom came up to me. And she said, every time you see my son, you ask him, what, how's his grades? And I was like, yes, ma'am. I, you know, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm worried about him. I'm just trying to, you know, let him, let him see what's let going him know. on. They kind of respect me. She said. I don't know. I ain't mean to cut you off, but I don't know what the time that's on your screen. If it says 45 seconds or one minute oh, yeah. left. You oh, see okay, it? Yeah. I say 40 seconds. Yeah. But she okay. told me, you've asked my son that every time you ask it is more than his father. His father's wow. never asked him about his grades. You wow. ask him every time you see him, his father's never asked about his grades. And that hit me, and that even put me into a, into a more thing of just asking people about their grades. That's it, yeah. Bro, trying to give back, seeing these kids and myself, I love it. Well, that's what's up, man. Look, I appreciate your time, man, and the, the, the nuggets that you gave us today, I think it's more than enough for these people to take. And I, and I appreciate you getting on my podcast, Life After Sports. Before you leave, I want to say thank you to everybody that chimed in. Make sure you guys follow Channing's podcast. I am an athlete 